Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the Adaptation Planning Guide webinar series hosted by the Office of Planning and Research, uh, the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program. Just give it another couple seconds for more folks to join us. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get rolling because we've got a packed agenda as usual. Hi everyone, if you're just joining, my name is Nikki Caravelli. I am an assistant planner with the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program. Um, and we're bringing to you today the third work workshop, excuse me, in the Adaptation Planning Guide workshop series, uh, focused on data and tools and vulnerability assessments today. Um, before we begin, I just want to provide a tribal land acknowledgement. We at the Office of Planning and Research, our office is based in Sacramento, California on ancestral Nishinan tribal land. Um, so just want to thank them for the stewardship of these lands for thousands of years. I myself am from the Lake Tahoe region, which is the ancestral land of the Washishu tribe or the Washoe tribe. Um, I also join you with Filipino ancestry and Cherokee ancestry, as well as German, Scotch, Irish, and um, Italian ancestry. Um, and so now we'd like to just invite everyone here who's on the call to share what tribal lands you're joining us from, if you know. Uh, if you don't know, we have a link that we can share in the chat. Um, it's uh, a nativelands.ca link um, that will tell you which, uh, which tribal land you're joining us from. Um, and so if you're not familiar with tribal land acknowledgements, um, oh, one second, let me make sure that that link goes in there. Sorry, I'm not able to share the link. Taylor or Sydney, if you can share the link for me, that would be great, thanks. Um, so a tribal land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects Native Americans as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between Native American tribes and their traditional territories. Um, and so the reason we do this is to recognize and appreciate um, and provide gratitude to those whose ter territory that we're residing on. Um, and honor those folks who have been living and working on the land long before most of us were here and our ancestors were here um, in, in, in any context, um, but definitely in the climate change planning context, it's important to understand the long standing history that has brought us here um, and to understand our place within that history and the colonization history of, the, of, um, of California. Um, and so we just need to be mindful of that um, and meaningfully address climate change um, by having that lens in mind. It's definitely worth noting that um, acknowledging tribal lands is also often a protocol of many tribal um, Native, Native American tribes. Um, and finally, just wanna say that if you're not sure what the current status is of the tribe that you are um, acknowledging, I'd invite you to just look into it and do some research, um, understand, understand where are they? What are they doing? What is their current relationship to the land? Um, if there are tribal folks online, welcome. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to drive right into the next part of our webinar. So here's a quick snapshot of our agenda. Um, Taylor Carnavale and I will introduce the vulnerability assessment guidance from the adaptation planning guide. Then we'll have a presentation on the local climate change snapshot tool. We have um, an awesome speaker panel lineup for you. Um, and a couple quick reminders. Uh, we will have a Q and A session at the end. So if you can hold your questions until then, please do, um, of course, 
We have uh, Sydney Short online who is available to help with technical questions um, and also to keep track of questions as they appear in the chat. Um, so that is available. Um, and we also are going to enable closed captioning. Um, and so uh, just give me one second uh, to figure that out because I just realized that we hadn't done that yet. Okay, so it should be enabled now. And if you do not want to see it or you do want to see it, um, you can enable that on your screen. Um, you, can, you can choose based on the, on the toolbar panel there whether or not you want to see the closed captioning or not. Um, thanks for bearing with us. So just a quick reminder, this is where we are in the series. We're on assess vulnerability. Our next webinar on April 14th will be more about adaptation strategies and prioritizing those. A couple of themes that I want to touch on from the past couple of webinars, in case you all weren't here, um, we're really wanting to drive on equity, starting, centering, and leading with equity in adaptation planning, um, and really build it into your process and your budgeting from the beginning. Uh, make your process and your engagement relatable. Incorporate case studies and storytelling and humanize the process. We hope we've been, we've been um, trying to exemplify that in this webinar series and provide a couple of different examples of that, but um, we're definitely not the experts on your community. You know how to, um, to really make it localized and make it hit home for the people that you work with. Um, finally, community engagement, um, making the process interactive and collaborative with a wide range of stakeholders, um, and then plan alignment. Use planning updates as opportunities to align priorities and policies across multiple plans and sectors. And if you want to dive in a little bit more on each of those, um, you can check out our past webinars uh, that are on the YouTube channel for the Office of Planning and Research. So now I'm going to just pause and invite you all again to share in the chat um, what climate impacts or vulnerabilities have personally impacted your story. What what brings you to the climate action table? Um, and so what I what I mean by that is I'll, I'll give an example um, and maybe invite some of some of our other presenters to to unmute and share as well. But um, coming from the Lake Tahoe region. Um, snow and skiing are really important to me. I grew up skiing. I basically was skiing before I was walking. I love the outdoors um, and wildfire smoke was always, you know, kind of there roughly in August. Um, but once I came back from college and started learning about climate change, um, I saw how the wildfires were getting worse um, and the snowpack was declining and um, really seeing those impacts on my home and the things that I care about doing and the people that I love really, really affected me and is, is part of my story and why, um, part of the reason why I come to you today with, um, with some of my own um, values and what, what I bring to the table. And so I think it's important to bring your own story into vulnerability assessments and, and climate adaptation planning in general. Um, so if, you, if you're comfortable sharing um, why you care about climate change, um, what climate impacts um, maybe have affected you specifically, um, maybe there are folks here who have been impacted by a wildfire, um, uh, share with us. And don't be afraid to share that too in your um, local climate planning context um, and help people see that it's, it's not just data that we're talking about, it's not some abstract future. It's here, it's now, and it's us, and it's our people and our communities and um, everything that we do. And so grounding it in that truth and that experience is important, um, I think, for bridging sometimes that communication gap between all of the numbers and the science and the projections, which not everyone can really understand, and connecting it to what, what, what does this actually mean? 
I'm not able to see the chat, but I can see lots of folks are, are contributing. So thanks for that. Um, okay, moving right along. Um, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Taylor Carnavale, to um, talk about this next uh, phase in our presentation. Uh, what is going on specifically in that adaptation planning guide phase two? Hi all, as Nikki mentioned, my name is Taylor Carnavale. Um, let's begin by speaking a little about what it takes to comprehensively assess vulnerability. Um, it involves a measure of the degree to which natural, built, and human systems are at risk of exposure to climate change impacts. Um, when the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program, or as we like to call it, ICARP, was first launched, our council recognized there was a lot of work to do to better understand the factors that drive vulnerability to climate risk, which led to the creation of our definition of climate vulnerability and climate vulnerable communities, um, which was outlined in this resource guide, defining vulnerable communities in the context of climate adaptation. And in this resource guide, we highlighted that vulnerable communities experience heightened risk and increased sensitivity to climate change, and they have less capacity and fewer resources to cope with, adapt to, or recover from climate impacts. And this is due to a variety of factors stemming from physical, so built environmental, social, political, or economic factors, which are further exacerbated by climate impacts. So this resource guide is a really helpful resource. It's intended to help local governments make this definition actionable in their adaptation planning and implementation efforts. And it contains an overview of some of the many state assessment tools that are really a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Sydney, our team member, will provide a link to this guide in the chat. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, phase two will cover assessing vulnerability. The adaptation planning guide outlines four sequential steps. So that is exposure, sensitivities and potential impacts, adaptive capacity and vulnerability scoring. And then it also emphasizes the role of kind of a fifth step throughout that process, engagement and outreach. Next slide. So um, as mentioned, the goal of phase two is to characterize the community's exposure to current and projected climate hazards. This hopefully will result in a finished vulnerability assessment. The approach in the APG was specifically assigned, designed to ensure the vulnerability assessment is consistent with California government code as amended by Senate Bill 379 and Senate Bill 1035. Next slide. When breaking down these steps, it's important to recognize the considerations that must be made throughout the process. The process. For exposure, ask yourself, what are the current and historical climate hazards? How might these hazards change in the future? When assessing sensitivities, potential impacts, and adaptive capacity, how might people and assets be affected? What is the adaptive capacity of people and assets? And lastly, when scoring vulnerability, how vulnerable are populations and assets to each climate hazard? And it's really important to let these questions kind of guide your process and make sure that you are covering all your bases, so to speak. Next slide. The APG emphasizes that, that outreach and engagement should be performed throughout the vulnerability assessment process. Ultimately, the goal is to collaborate with community members to identify neighborhood strengths, assets, climate change effects, and existing adaptive capacity. As mentioned in our phase one equitable, equitable engagement webinar, it is important that this engagement and outreach is both inclusive and comprehensive. Make sure everyone who is being impacted by the adaptation planning and these climate risks, specifically the most vulnerable communities, are being included and given a seat at the table during this process. This outreach and engagement could look like targeted stakeholder interviews or focus groups, storytelling timelines, participatory asset mapping, and community-based participatory research. Next slide. We know that climate change is and will continue to exacerbate many hazards, so it's important to consider both historical and projected impacts. 
some methods for collecting information on past impacts and augmenting this with more forward-looking information include desk research on historical climate change effects, desk research on potential future climate impacts, interview stakeholders on historical and potential future climate impacts, and summarize findings on potential future climate impacts. And I saw in the chat the, the need for meaningful storytelling, and that's a really important consideration to bring throughout. Next slide. Another piece of this is choosing context specific data parameters, like selecting emission scenarios, regional variations and climate change effects, selecting climate models, and selecting an appropriate time frame. Next slide. So the ICARP team provides many tools and resources on our state adaptation clearinghouse. That's at resilientca.org. These include are defining vulnerability, vulnerable communities in the context of climate adaptation resource guide. It allows you to search and compare tools, data, and scientific studies. Um, it includes the APG, which we're speaking about today, and also case studies on how to use the right science and make sure that you're learning from the best practices of other state partners. Also, um, the Civic Spark program, which is a really meaningful way to add capacity um, and incorporate young professionals into this sphere is currently accepting project partner and fellow applications. Next slide. Also, we include phase two downloadable templates on the adaptation clearinghouse that can be really helpful when building out these processes. So those include stakeholder interview questionnaires, interview tracking templates, summarize and scoring vulnerability templates, and sample ad adaptive capacity matrices. So this is really important. They'll also help guide as they address like all four of those important steps outlined in the APG. Next steps, uh, next slide, please. And then I will pass it back to my teammate, Nikki. Awesome. Thanks so much, Taylor. And Taylor is an awesome executive fellow, part of the Capital Fellows Program, um, helping us out over at the Office of Planning and Research. Um, thanks so much, Taylor. So I'll just briefly touch on SB 379. I won't go into too much detail on the statute as we've we've covered this a couple times in the previous um, couple webinars, but just a reminder that um, both SB 379 and 1035 uh, require a regular update of safety elements to address climate vulnerability and adaptation and specific hazards. Um, more importantly for this webinar, or I shouldn't say more importantly, but um, in order to meet SB 379 requirements, conducting a vulnerability assessment is actually essential and the statute lays out um, much more detail on, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> on this component uh, more than any of the others. So just a, a quick recap of what's in the statute is, um, it, just a vulnerability assessment should include, but not be limited to the following information from this list of sources. So CalADAPT, which um, Lucy Andrews is gonna go into in just a few minutes, the most recent adaptation planning guide, local agencies um, and information that they can provide on the types of assets, resources, and populations that will be sensitive to various climate change exposures. And yes, that can include natural and um, ecosystem assets as well, um, and their current ability to deal with the impacts of climate change. Um, Fourthly, uh, information on historical data on natural hazards and events, including locally prepared maps of areas subject to previous risk, areas that are vulnerable, and sites that have been repeatedly damaged, existing and planned development and identified at-risk areas, including structures, roads, utilities, and essential public facilities. And then finally, federal, state, regional, and local agencies with responsibility for the protection of public health and safety in the environment including special districts and local offices of emergency services. So now I'm excited to pass the mic over to Lucy Andrews, a PhD student with UC Berkeley, who will walk us through the local climate change snapshot tool. Lovely. Thanks so much, Nikki. Uh, I'll share my screen and, and get rolling here. Um, there we go. Uh, 
So my name is Lucy, as Nikki mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at Berkeley in environmental science, uh, but more importantly in this context, I'm a researcher uh, working on CalAdapt, which is housed at UC Berkeley, but is an enterprise um, partnership between uh, folks at Berkeley, the Strategic Growth Council, the Energy Commission, uh, and many other partners like the Office of Planning and Research, as well as local community planners, nonprofit organizations, um, other academic research centers. We hope that CalAdapt continues to grow as a resource to serve the state writ large and as a connecting entity for a lot of these different efforts and groups. CalAdapt is a website, most simply, that serves to provide the data and tools necessary for quantitative climate change analysis in California. This is one toolbox among many for thinking about climate change. Um, and in this context, uh, CalAdapt allows you to access projections using different uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios and climate models um, to look at future climate conditions. Um, you can also visualize those projections as graphs, as maps, as tables, uh, and then download the data for you to use in your own analytic environment, whether that is a tool like Microsoft Excel, a programming language like the R statistical programming language, or a GIS type environment uh, like ArcMap, for example. Um, the URL is caladapt.org, um, relatively straightforward, and I'm going to pop over to that web page now to show you the interface. So when you land on the Caladapt homepage, you're greeted here uh, with this nice little Yosemite background, and then a list of the climate change data tools that Caladapt provides. Uh, the one that we'll be talking about today is the local climate change snapshot but it's certainly not the only tool available to you to access and visualize and interpret climate change projections. We also have tools that will display things like cooling degrees and heating degree days. If you work in energy provision, for example, and need that kind of information. You can take a look at the changing nature of extreme precipitation events through time or um, the change in extreme heat patterns where you are. So CalAdapt has many different tools to engage this information. Um, we also have resources, um, particularly on our blog page, where we have recordings of webinars that we've given on different topics. We have blog posts that write up uh, different ways of looking at data or accessing data. Um, so we hope that this is an evolving resource for the community. Um, I'm always happy to take questions or connect with folks in um, you know, a meeting or something about what's on CalAdapt, but today we're going to move to focus specifically on the local climate change snapshot tool. Uh, so let me pop back to my own slides to talk a little bit about what that is. So CalAdapt originally came from um, an effort in the energy sector to incorporate climate change projections in adaptation and resiliency planning. Uh, but of course, every sector in California needs to be thinking about climate change, not just the energy sector. Uh, and so we've recognized in the past couple of years a need to serve a more diverse user base who would like climate change information um, for a variety of different applications and with a variety of different backgrounds. Um, so we've spent the past year and a half creating a, the local climate change snapshot tool in partnership with um, many different beta testers and interviewers and focus groups uh, in order to make climate change information straightforward, introductory and accessible uh, in order to support a few specific purposes. First, municipal adaptation planning, for example, local hazard mitigation plans uh, or local coastal programs, um, also intended to support education. We've seen many folks start to use the tools provided on CalAdapt in high school classrooms, for example. Uh, and we also hope that this can support advocacy, that this is a way for you to um, advocate for the direction of resources toward climate change adaptation in ways that are locally specific equitable, racially just, and ecologically responsible. The local climate change snapshot tool aims to accomplish these things by simplifying some of the settings that if you've used CalAdapt before are fully customizable in our other tools. So CalAdapt um, in the local climate change snapshot tool um, pre-selects for you a number of climate models and time intervals such that you don't have to do that yourself and you can quickly access information. To use the tool, there are three steps. The first thing that you have to do is select a location and you can select a boundary around that location if you would like. For example, you can select an address in the city of Stockton or you can select the boundary of the city of Stockton 
as an entire planning unit. So first you need to tell the tool where you would like information to represent. Then you simply view the projections for a collection of physical climate variables. And I'll get to those in a second, but they generally describe changes in projected temperature, changes in projected precipitation, and changes in projected wildfire occurrence. Once you've gotten familiar with the projections for your area, um, we encourage you to connect with additional resources so that the data becomes more interpretable, more customizable, more contextualized, and the local climate change snapshot tool aims to support you in finding those resources as well. So when you come to the landing page, uh, you'll see a screen that looks like this. Uh, on the bottom half, there's an inset map on the lower right that will help you to see the location that you've selected. And then there's an address bar where you can identify the place you're curious about and the boundary around that place um, for which you're fetching data. So you can type in an address, you know, your office building or the location of a project, for example. You can type in a county if you're curious for data that is spatially averaged over the extent of your county. You could look at a city boundary, at a census tract, or at a watershed, which we've identified in this case using the HUC-10 code. To give examples of those boundaries, um, when I look at San Joaquin County in California, for example, the map will change to display boundary outlines, so the county outlines, and I can click on the county that I would like. Here's an example of doing the same thing for a city, for the city of Stockton. The map will change to show the city boundaries, and then I can click to select the feature of interest. Then you'll be moved to a page that shows the suite of variables that you can work with and the data for each. And I'll navigate the tool myself in a second, but just want to provide this overview here. For temperature information, uh, you can view the annual average maximum temperature. So this is taking the maximum daily temperature for all the days in the year and then averaging that. You can do the same thing for the minimum temperature. So the minimum temperature of every day in the year averaged over all 365 or 366 days. You can also take a look at extreme heat days, the projected occurrence of extreme heat days in the future, and warm nights. On the precipitation front, you can identify the maximum one day precipitation expected, the maximum length of a dry spell, and the annual precipitation volume. And then for wildfire, you can take a look at the annual average area burned. The tool will present information for you using two different emissions scenarios, which in the climate science world are often referred to using the acronym RCP. RCP stands for Representative Concentration Pathway, uh, which indicates the projected change in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere through time. And there are specific trajectories or specific RCPs that the IPCC has established um, as useful for uh, climate change analysis looking forward. The ones that we tend to use in California are RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. Uh, and much of the guidance that you'll read from folks like the Office of Planning and Research will, re will reference one or both of these two scenarios. RCP or Representative Concentration Pathway 4.5 is the medium emission scenario, wherein global greenhouse gas emissions peak in the year 2040 and then decline through the end of the century. RCP 8.5 is considered the high emission scenario, which some folks will refer to as business as usual, uh, in which emissions just continue to rise throughout the 21st century. So if you're particularly risk averse and curious about what might be some of the worst case scenarios, you might lean toward using RCP 8.5. If you're looking for a scenario in which we do meet many of our uh, reduction pledges, you might choose 4.5. In general, we recommend that folks look at both to have a range of possible future conditions. Um, but of course, your selection of greenhouse gas emission scenario will depend on your own risk tolerance. Some of the instructions you may have received if you are filing a plan or filing a grant application, um, as well as any other context relevant to your community. But when in doubt, consider both. So let's take a look. Um, I'll open up the tool on my end and show you how I navigate the interface. So to get to the tool, you can first um, click on the tool link on the homepage here. 
or you can go to the tool section in Caladapt where it's the first tool listed. So we'll click there and we can take a look. So the first thing that I have to do in the process of working with the tool is identify a location. So I'll type my location into this box and then I have to make sure to hit enter so that it goes to the system and uh, is identified as my location for the snapshot. So um, because we've had a lot of folks talking about wildfire and concerns about snow loss in the chat, let's take a look at the town of Truckee, Truckee, California. So when I hit enter, I have a list of potential matching locations. I'll select Truckee here. And I can see that there's a pin that shows up in the map. I can do a visual check to make sure that that's correct. Um, and sounds good, I like that. Uh, so we'll hit enter, have Truckee. I can then also identify boundaries around Truckee if I'm curious. So for example, I could look at um, the city of Truckee itself. Let's do that, that seems like a nice thing to do. So I'll select that polygon and hit generate snapshot. When I do that, I'm brought to the page where there's data. At the top, I'm off, I can go back and select a new location if I'd like. I can see in the inset map that I've got the place I'm curious about. And all of the impacts are listed here at the top, temperature, precipitation, and wildfire. For temperature, I have a few different options to look at um, changes in temperature patterns through time. Let's pick extreme heat days because that's often um, a pretty compelling indicator to look at. And the extreme heat is characterized as the number of days in a year when the daily ma maximum temperature is above a specified threshold. That threshold will change by location because the climate science community in California has described extreme heat as the 98th percentile temperature in the historical record. So the hottest, hottest 2% of days looking back. In Truckee, that happens to be 88.8 .8 degrees Fahrenheit. So this figure, this graph, the table below will tell me through time how many extreme heat days above 88.8 .8 degrees Fahrenheit are projected per year between now and the end of the century. So scrolling down, the first thing I'm presented with is a graph. In the graph, I can see that I have the historical data represented by this dark gray line. So that is the observed extreme heat day pattern in Truckee from uh, 1950 to 2005. And then I have my two RCP scenarios, my two emission scenarios that we talked about. RCP 4.5 being the medium emission scenario and 8.5 being the high emission scenario. The line in the middle of each series, the dark purple line or the dark teal line represents the average of 32 models that are commonly used for modeling uh, across the world and particularly in California. So we've taken a bunch of different climate models and averaged them all to create this line of central tendency. You'll then see that there's also this shaded area. So there's a purple shaded area or a teal shaded area. That's the full range of the models. So one of the models produced the lowest expected count of extreme heat days through time. Another would have produced the greatest expected count of extreme heat days for any given year. And that is represented by this full shaded area. I can customize the figure by toggling the data series on and off, clicking these buttons here to make it uh, show what is useful to my context. I can also toggle on modeled historical data, which is what we might call a hindcast, where folks are running the models essentially backwards to recreate the historical record, both so that we can compare model data to model data, looking at the modeled history and the modeled future, uh, as well as confirm the, um, the utility of the models um, if they accurately represent past conditions, we have greater confidence in the way that they will represent future conditions. If you have questions about these figures, we've got plenty of links on the left-hand side to connect you with help and more information so you can take a tour of the visualization that will click you through different dimensions. You can learn more about the data. So here's a pop-up that will show you where this information comes from. You can identify some best practices for working with climate data that climate scientists have recommended to you. And you can explore additional tools that will show you uh, extreme heat information, but perhaps with more customizable parameters. Below that, we have a table that gives you uh, sort of 
quick hitting values for common time periods of interests. So when you're working with climate data, we'll recommend that you work with um, data that is what we would say temporally aggregated, where you're not looking at any one year, you know, you haven't identified the data point for 2090 as your uh, variable of interest, but instead you've averaged information over decadal periods so that you're understanding long-term changes in climate. Typically, we'll recommend that you average data over 30 year periods. That's um, endorsed both by the planning community in California and the scientific community in California. Uh, and if you would like, for example, to identify a mid-century time period, we'll give you a 30 year window centered on 2050. End of century is the 30 year window approaching the year 2100. So for each of these emission scenarios, for each of the planning time periods, we have a representation in the change from the baseline. So how the future will be uh, different from the past. We have then the 30 year average. So the absolute value and the 30 year range, the full interval of, uh, or the full envelope of variability that the models have projected. So to interpret this, I might say, for example, that under the high emission scenario, RCP 4.5, for the mid-century time period, which is 2035 to 2064, we expect to see an increase of 26 extreme heat days per year in Truckee, California. So there will be an additional 26 extreme heat days per year on average for the years in the mid-century time period. The 30-year range is that full envelope of variability. So the model that projected the lowest suggested there would be 13 extreme heat days. The model that projected the greatest suggests 50 extreme heat days per year. And the 30 year average is that line of central tendency. So we expect um, on average 30 extreme heat days per year under the high emission scenario for the mid-century time period. If you like this table and wanna download it, you can do that here with these buttons that say download graphic, download data. You will be able to download the image, we can also produce a PDF report that has this web page essentially as a screenshot. And then there are some footnotes here that will give you additional information like links to the original papers that published these data sets. All of these data sets in CalAdapt were produced in and through California's fourth climate change assessment. And as the fifth assessment gets rolling, we will update the information accordingly. And then lastly, um, we have connections to more information. So we have additional tools on CalAdapt that relate to the variable that you're working with. So when I'm working with extreme heat day, for example, extreme heat days, I'm connected to information about annual average temperature, the extreme heat tool itself, which allows more customization. You can identify your own temperature threshold. You can identify the length of an extreme heat spell, for example, that's of interest to you. And you can also look at maps of change. So if you wanted to create a map, you could use that tool. Below that, we have additional resources that exist external to CalAdapt. So for example, the one that we like to point folks toward these days is the California Adaptation Clearinghouse. If you click on this button, you'll be directed to the state's repository of climate change adaptation resources, studies, manuals, um, where the applicability of those resources to temperature impacts is pre-selected for you. So this will direct you to everything related to temperature on the clearinghouse. So that's the local climate change snapshot tool. You can come back up to the top to select other variables of interest if you're curious about, for example, the maximum length of a dry spell, that kind of information is here. Um, but I'm gonna pop back to my slides for just one last minute with takeaway messages on working with climate change data. So we suggest first that you work across temporal and spatial scales. When you select a single year, or a single latitude and longitude coordinate, you run the risk of selecting something that is uh, anomalous compared to broader trends. So if I you know, selected by accident a single year that was modeled as being anomalously hot or anomalously cool against the background trend and change, um, I run the risk of not having the full picture ready to go. So we suggest you look at community scale analysis, that you look at 30 year windows rather than single years, and that you work with a range of models. Uh, the models all represent different dimensions of our climate systems with varying degrees of applicability to California. 
Uh, and so when you work with a few different models, um, you, run, you, you are better able to capture the full conditions that we experience here. And we recommend that when possible, you compare model data to model data. Um, that way you are comparing apples to apples um, in the sense that um, the modeled historical record compared to the modeled future conditions um, tends to present the best picture of relative change. The local climate change snapshot tool does all of this for you automatically. So if you're working with that tool, um, rest assured all of these things are taken care of. And with that, I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions right now or Nikki, you'll hold questions for the end, but that is what I have to say about this tool. Thanks everybody for your attention and uh, do stay in touch with how my colleagues and I can support you. We're happy to um, build additional tools to serve your needs, interpret the information for you or connect you to additional resources. Um, we can definitely um, make your vulnerability analysis all easier um, given our technical skills. Thanks so much, Lucy. We're going to, uh, I'm just gonna take one question that I saw pop up in the chat, um, but Shruti, who is also on the line from the CalADAPT team is doing her best to answer um, the, the many questions. Folks are very curious about this tool and the different parameters. So Shruti is doing her best to answer those questions in the chat, but one came up Lucy, how would you go about um, selecting data specifically for unincorporated polygons, unincorporated counties? Yeah, that is a slightly more uh, involved effort. Um, you can do a few things. One is you can identify a boundary that is comparable in the sense that if, for example, you're working in a county where much of the area is unincorporated, you could select the county writ large. Um, if you're specifically concerned about an exact unincorporated area, we will actually direct you to another tool. Um, maybe that's not what you wanted to hear, but we have other things for you for that purpose. So I'll share my screen briefly to talk about what that is. And then if you and I wanna connect offline about that, I'm happy to do that with you. Um, so if I go back to CalAdapt um, and click on data at the top, I am directed to initially here the data download tool. Uh, I can use the data download tool to download original data sets. Uh, and in doing so, I can upload my own polygon. So I can say, here's the area I'm curious about. Um, that would be, I think how I would recommend you go about that when you're using a boundary that is not easily configured to be either a point address, a city, a county, a watershed, et cetera. Um, when folks are using a point address, um, what's actually happening under the hood is they're selecting a grid cell. So climate models are gridded data products and the grids are placed on top of California such that every cell is six kilometers by six kilometers. So when you drop an address on a map, you're getting the six kilometer by six kilometer cell containing that address. So if you're unincorporated area, you're curious about as small, you could use an address. If it's larger, um, we direct you to go to the data download process to be able to upload your own polygon for analysis. Awesome, thanks Lucy. All right, so we're gonna move right on to our, our speaker panel now, a couple of case studies from folks who have done vulnerability assessments. Um, and our first speaker is Armin Munavar. He's a global technologist from Jacobs and he will be speaking about the Sonoma Water Agency's vulnerability assessment efforts. Thanks, Nikki. Um, hopefully, you can see the slides okay. And Nikki, you can give me a thumbs up. Make sure it's okay. okay yep, thanks. looks great. Great. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk about some efforts that uh, we've been working with Sonoma Water in the North Coast on climate adaptation. Uh, my name is Armin Manever. I'm with uh, with Jacobs and we've been supporting uh, Sonoma Water. I believe some of them are on this call as well to, to look out kind of a forward looking study at climate adaptation with uh, uh, throughout the sectors that they manage within the, within the North Coast, primarily in Sonoma and Marin counties. So um, we'll talk a little bit today about the vulnerability assessment and then a little bit broader context about what the adaptation plan is is intended to, to accomplish. 
Uh, Sonoma County has been uh, probably more impacted than many um, throughout kind of the Western United States. We do a lot of work throughout um, throughout North America and, and globally, even certainly Sonoma County has experienced a lot of uh, natural system impacts over the past, uh, past five, 10 years. Um, some might say that they've got lots of experience in, in resiliency because of firsthand real-time uh, emergency management with fires and floods and the like. Uh, but climate variability is a major um, driver in, in this particular area and really looking at, to, we'll be testing the resilience of systems in the future. So the climate adaptation plan that Sonoma Water is leading is really an effort to improve the understanding of climate impacts onto um, their water supply, sanitation and flood systems and to develop adaptation strategies to create more resilient systems. We really look at the kind of the resilience of climate as being a lead into overall resiliency planning. Um, and there's some efforts underway to look even beyond climate resilience and look at it from a multi-hazard approach. Uh, but first, what does Sonoma Water do? They, Sonoma Water is a, a wholesale water utility in, in the North Coast. They serve about 600,000 North Bay residents with water, um, water supply. They also manage uh, portions of the Russian River through uh, reservoirs and in-stream uh, flow projects and restoration projects. And they partner with the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers on the management of, of uh, two major reservoirs. Uh, they provide wastewater collection and treatment services for about 75,000 residents in, in uh, Sonoma and Marin counties. And then they provide flood management on many of the uh, major and smaller uh, streams within the, the county. And then finally, they, through some of their efforts, they've, uh, they manage power generation through their, their hydropower facilities and groundwater recharge. And I, and I believe just a, a few years ago, they've won some awards on basically going carbon free on their water delivery through, through the use of uh, renewables. So you can see the map on the right here generally shows the, the system that they are responsible for managing all the way up on the Eel River to the far north, all the way down to San Pablo Bay and delivery to a number of water contractors throughout. Uh, this region is heavily impacted by, by extremes um, and flooding being one of the, the largest. Atmospheric rivers tend to drive virtually all of flood uh, damages and flood um, issues in this particular region in the North Coast. That was a very good paper that, was, that we're using to help share this story in terms of uh, proportion of economic losses due to atmospheric rivers. So almost 99% of, of all um, insured losses are associated with atmospheric river events. And these are these are swaths of moisture in the atmosphere that tend to be funneled from the mountain off the, near the islands of Hawaii and into the north coast of California, but also central coast um, has quite large impacts. So you can see these dots on the left here were, are where the, the proportion of the damages that are associated with atmospheric rivers. You can see most of coastal California is heavily impacted by atmospheric rivers. Um, Second major uh, driver for this region is wildfires and they've experienced their share of wildfires and damages over the past five years. Uh, amongst the top 20 largest California uh, wildfires, um, three of the top five are within this region. Um, ones that were both in 2018 um, and the 2017 um, fires as well as the ones just this past year in, in August were the largest, ended up being the, the top two wildfires in California. So Sonoma Water is, is, um, is really a leader in, in thinking through adaptation. So they're not coming at it from, from the very beginning. They've been investing for about 15 years in partnerships and to better understand their impacts in the region from partnerships with Scripps and the uh, the Center for Western Water Extremes on atmospheric river forecasting. They're doing some innovative work on forecast informed operations, 
some really interesting work on the wildfire or fire cameras for early detection of, of wildfire. Um, and then you know, the local hazard mitigation plans and really trying to tie all that together into our adaptation plan. So the adaptation plan is really looking to guide the uh, Sonoma Waters assessment of climate risks for their water supply sanitation and flood management systems and serve as a roadmap for developing and implementing adaptation strategies. Uh, we've applied a framework that's quite similar to, to the OPR, the APG uh, guidance framework, a slightly different layout to it, but really looking at a five-step process in which we're scoping the problem, understanding the, the impact of those changes, doing vulnerability and risk assessments, which we'll talk about today, and then building adaptation strategies and implementing them. Uh, we've kind of taken this framework and, and looked at it from a system standpoint. So in the, far, in the upper right, looking at the different systems that make up um, communities. So you can think of them as a systems of systems approach. Many times we can't look at all of the systems simultaneously. So we look at one system or two systems or three systems to do a little bit of a deeper dive. And that's what we've done here with Sonoma Water, looking at their water, their flood and their sanitation system. We identified kind of the major drivers of, of um, climatic and hydrologic changes in the region. So temperature changes, both um, like Lucy, you just presented a nice illustration of the different temperature, whether it's average temperature or extremes. Um, we looked at sea level rise using some of the tools, the Cosmos tool that's also on the Caladap site. Uh, changes in precipitation. We're really interested in extreme precipitation in this region, not necessarily average precipitation. So we've used um, lots of downscaled methods and to get to basically a NOAA Atlas type of uh, one day, 24 hour rainfall events. Looked at expanding droughts and wildfires and all of this resulting in river flooding aspects. Uh, we, when we first began this effort, there was a look at the older, climate models that were part of this CMIP-3 data set. They were then updated um, for a CMIP-5 data set, which is shown in the red, the red bars. And then we'll soon be updating this to at least indicate where the CMIP-6 data is showing um, differences in, in the warming. Our initial look at it is that the CMIP-6 will be quite similar to the CMIP-5 data. So we have increases in temperature throughout the region. This is quite consistent throughout California. Um, we have substantial increases in sea level rise that impact the lower parts of the system in San Pablo Bay and also at the Russian River outlet. Uh, using the OPC guidance on sea level rise projections, we've developed ranges of, of um, future sea level rise trajectories. And then uh, using the Cosmos tool, we've been able to map out those impact of those sea level rise for different uh, storm events in the, in the lower parts of the system. And then uh, significantly increasing extremes, we've been looking at um, changes in, in, in daily 24 hour rainfall events. And as you can see here across a range of models, we're seeing about 10 to 20% increases in the 100 year 24 hour rainfall events, which is substantial for an area that's already impacted heavily by, by historical extremes. Um, and then for wildfire risk, we've been um, using information from other researchers and, and then adapting it for our work here and looking at changing uh, probability of, uh, of major uh, wildfires and what impacts that has on the watershed, on the water quality and on the communities. So our, through our vulnerability assessment, what we've done is essentially map each of those major climate threats to major assets that are in the water supply, flood and sanitation uh, realm of Sonoma water. Um, each one of those facilities were visited and mapped out in terms of the relative impact from, from uh, those climate uh, projections. And through vulnerability assessment, we really look at it in two aspects. First, there's sensitivity. Um, there was a good discussion about um, earlier in this conversation about the exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity. And really, we look at it from 
kind of a sensitivity, how sensitive is an asset to a potential, potential change in the climate? And then how much um, flexibility or adaptive capacity already exists within that particular um, asset or facility or operation or system that allows you to respond to some of those potential changes. And the combination of those vulnerability uh, of the sensitivity and adaptive capacity is what we call vulnerability. So something can be quite sensitive, but if there's lots of flexibility in the in the assets um, ability to respond, it may have high adaptive capacity and therefore may not be terribly vulnerable. Um, conversely, if it has very little adaptive capacity and has high sensitivity, it will certainly be a vulnerable asset. So we went through that for about um, 50 individual facilities and operations throughout the system, and then went into a risk assessment. So the vulnerability tells you kind of how vulnerable is an asset, but it doesn't really tell you kind of what is the risk to, to the broader system function or social aspects, governance or financial. So then we take the consequence of those uh, changes. And then we've used um, confidence in climate projections as a, as a illustration of likelihood. And when we combine that consequence and likelihood, we, we're ending up with a risk assessment. And we've characterized risk across those four categories, system function, social, governance, and financial. And I think the last point I wanted to make on this slide is that Oftentimes we ignore the far ends of the, of the projections. We say, well, they're not in the middle of the projections. Um, so some of those extreme projections, and you might call them the black swans, these are the low probability, high consequence events. Um, you can think of something like Houston, Houston with the, the deep freeze and all the cascade of those impacts as maybe being something like a black swan event. So oftentimes we tend to ignore those in, in climate adaptation planning. And so we're intentionally trying to incorporate some of those black swans and cascading risks into our risk assessments, even though the likelihood may be quite low of those events. Uh, and then finally, we take, took all the vulnerability assessment and for each one of the major assets or facilities, and this could be applied for for natural assets as well, like the, the river systems or, or forest management. But we've done it here for their particular assets and mapped out the high, moderate, and low vulnerability um, areas. We've done that for their water supply system, similarly for their flood management system. Um, and you can see extreme precip, river flooding, and sea level rise in most cases are the drivers, although wildfire tends to be a driver in the water supply system. And then similarly for sanitation, we've done, done the same type of work. And I won't go into the details. Maybe if there are questions, I'll, I can jump into that later. Uh, but then from all of that high, we, we focused on the high and moderately high vulnerable areas and went through a workshopping process with the agency and their staff to really identify a broad collection of ideas on how they might respond or increase the resilience of those systems. And then we synthesize those into about 80 different project concepts. Um, and then we finally took those concepts and started to build them out. Not, okay, it's not just a single idea to do here and another idea to do there, but really we want to think about it strategically and how do we build portfolios that start to, to manage our risks. So we've developed three, um, three portfolios for each of their systems. Each one of them has about 20 or 25 individual projects that make up elements of that proposal or of that portfolio. And then common across all of those were a number of integrated concepts that might have the, the potential to make the largest improvement in system resilience. And those are listed here, things like a watershed resilience program, really focusing on, on wildfire and sediment and water quality management, land management for improvements at water, um, water and land, uh, things like a regional flood strategy, building a hydroclimate program, um, some of their um, forecast informed operations. So that is where we are currently with the process. We're now working with uh, the agency to, to build out implementation approaches, which will involve funding, organizational alignment, science tools, a public awareness uh, strategy, monitoring and partnerships. 
and they're making some current uh, headway right now in early partnerships for kind of the multi-benefit cross-sectoral adaptation strategies. Um, we're looking to release this climate adaptation plan in late summer of this year, so probably in the September timeframe. Um, and I think with that, I will wrap up and take any questions when it's appropriate. Nikki. Thanks so much, Armin. Um, so we're not going to take any direct questions for Armin right now. Um, Armin, there is one question for you in the chat, if you could take a look at that and maybe type sure. your answer into the chat. Um, so we're going to move right on to our next speaker, Alderon Laird, who is a senior environmental planner with Greenway Partners, um, who will be speaking with us about the Humboldt Bay Sea Level Rise Adaptation Plan. And I, of course, have those slides. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm speaking to you from uh, the Wiat land, uh, the Wiat called Humboldt Bay uh, Wigi. And uh, this image here is the, the Wiat's World Renewal Ceremonial Site. It's a shell midden uh, that's out in the center of the bay that's been there for probably thousands of years. And what you're seeing now is an average king tide. And um, this uh, cultural site, uh, unfortunately, if it's not, uh, it measures aren't employed, will be inundated uh, before the end of the century. So if we can go on to the next slide. And so why do we have sea level rise? Just uh, you know, in general terms, uh, as we have greenhouse gas emissions, the atmosphere is heated up. The ocean has absorbed most of that heat and uh, through thermal expansion, we've had most of the sea level rise uh, this century as a result of that. We're now starting to see uh, the melting of land-based glaciers contributing to sea level rise, which will probably greatly accelerate in the last half of this century. So if we can go to the next slide. On Humboldt Bay, just uh, not that long ago, about 15 years ago, uh, we had a major uh, storm event uh, coinciding with a king tide. And uh, the governor ended up declaring a state of disaster on Humboldt Bay. The entire bay was filled up, it was spilling. Uh, we had probably half a dozen major emergency repair uh, shoreline projects that were implemented. And this extreme uh, water elevation set a record on Humboldt Bay. And unfortunately, that water elevation was less than a foot higher than our annual, our mean annual maximum water elevation or our average king tide. So on Humboldt Bay under our present situation, we're not looking at a lot of sea level rise uh, to cause some significant impacts in our region. So can we go to the next slide? In looking at uh, sea level rise uh, impacts and assessments in an area, it's helpful to uh, stratify the, the area spatially into hydrographic areas, areas with a common shoreline uh, that are uh, protecting the low lying areas behind those. On Humboldt Bay, we have six different hydrographic areas and uh, two spits uh, that uh, protect uh, Humboldt Bay, which is analogous to a lagoon. And so uh, you can do a vulnerability assessments for an individual hydrographic area or for the entire region and then present the, the assessment uh, results uh, by hydrographic area. And if we go to the next slide. Their sea level rise vulnerability assessment process is, is really a variation on uh, hazard mitigation planning that's generally done for flood hazards. Um, we start off with exposure of when will sea level rise likely happen in this area, where will it occur, um, what type of impacts uh, would sea level rise uh, manifest in our area, and then uh, looking at what assets are in those areas that will likely be exposed uh, to sea level rise. And then lastly, uh, looking at individual assets and looking at their uh, vulnerability, their susceptibility, the capacity to adapt as we just heard, but also looking at what we call their criticality. What's the consequence of that asset being impaired? Uh, looking at vulnerability and risks is a way of helping you try to prioritize assets for adaptation treatment. In the next slide. 
And so on Humboldt Bay, uh, we were fortunate in that we had um, a local geology group that looked at vertical uh, land uh, motion trends. And we had a local uh, hydrology engineer who uh, looked at sea level rise projections. And what we're really focusing on in our region is a relative sea level rise or local sea level rise. Um, we can have a sea level rise on a global and a regional basis that's used static uh, water elevation changes, but uh, relative sea level rise takes into account uh, both vertical land motion as well as water elevation changes. And so to it, the next slide. On Humboldt Bay, looking at all of the NOAA tide gauges for the West Coast, um, because of vertical land motion trends, uh, Humboldt Bay has the highest rate of sea level rise on the entire West Coast. Over the last century, we've experienced about 18 inches of sea level rise. And right next door to the, to the Humboldt Bay tide gauge, about a, an hour north at Crescent City, is the lowest uh, rate of uh, sea level rise on the entire West Coast. We have the two extremes side by side, and that's a result of tectonic activity off of Cape Mendocino, where we have the triple junction with the Gorda Plate, the North American Plate, and the Pacific Plate. Humboldt Bay is attached to the North American Plate and it's being pulled down. Therefore, we have uh, such a high rate of sea level rise. In Crescent City, the Pacific Plate is diving under the North American and pushing the ground up. And as a result, they have virtually no sea level rise change in the Crescent City area. So can we go to the next uh, slide? And so um, OPC in 2018 uh, released its uh, sea level rise uh, guidance document and it contained projections for all of the, the NOAA tide gauges on the California coast. And it includes a low risk aversion. Uh, um, it's a probably probabilistic based projection and they included a low risk aversion uh, projections and a medium to high risk aversions as well as an extreme. And for instance, depending on the design life of the structure, say you're looking at a shoreline trail that has a design life of 25 years, you might look at the projections under the lower risk aversion column. Whereas if you're looking at rebuilding or remodeling a wastewater treatment facility, you might use the projections under the high risk aversion uh, column. And so this gives us uh, site specific relative sea level rise projections rather than using representational uh, tide gauge uh, projections, which is the way things have been done before this document was released. And so could we go to the next slide? In trying to figure out where sea level rise will affect an area, a hydrodynamic model needs to be generated. It's a three-dimensional model for water elevations and then inundation mapping associated with that model it needs to be produced. Fortunately on Humboldt Bay, Northern Hydrology and Engineers produced a hydrodynamic model and inundation maps uh, to show us where uh, areas may be affected. But as was mentioned earlier, the US Geologic Service has uh, the coastal storm modeling system. They have an online viewer uh, that is, uh, can show you with inundation maps, what areas would be vulnerable at different water elevations. And NOAA's Digital Coast uh, provides the same uh, service for you. If we can go to the next slide. Our uh, in, uh, hydrodynamic model uh, shows water elevation changes in half meter increments. And um, we can look at various tidal datums of mean high or high water or uh, mean annual maximum water at that uh, for that sea level rise elevation. And it enables us to look at what areas are vulnerable um, at uh, these different water elevations. The inundation um, of, of tied to the tidal datum is an indication of the frequency or duration of uh, inundation. We could have nuisance flooding from king tides and uh, with more chronic flooding with the monthly high tide and then essentially a site conversion with the uh, daily mean high tides. And so all of this data is nested within the, the layers for each of these water elevations. These are two communities that are at risk in just 20 years. Uh, one community on the right, King Salmon, would be tidally inundated. The other community, Fields Landing, would be flooded with emerging groundwater in response to sea level rise. If we go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
and uh, their model goes all the way up to two meters with the full range of tidal datums. And here's the Eureka waterfront and all of the bulk cargo facilities that would be, uh, as we can see, would be underwater before the end of the century with two meters of sea level rise. So these inundation maps based on these models show especially what areas are vulnerable uh, to tidal inundation. And, um, but one of the critical things, if we can go to the next slide, in sea level rise uh, assessment work, it's really the shoreline. The shoreline is the front line of defense uh, and vulnerability in response to sea level rise. And so on Humboldt Bay, we conducted a shoreline inventory and mapping and uh, to, for the entire 102 miles of shoreline. If we go to the next slide. And this uh, shoreline uh, assessment included uh, mapping uh, the distribution of shoreline structure and cover, uh, uh, which included erosion or uh, fortifications. Uh, next slide. We also generated shoreline elevation profiles so we could identify low lying reaches of the existing shoreline. And if we go to the next slide, if we combine uh, uh, locations where we have shoreline erosion and low elevation shoreline segments, we developed a vulnerability rating uh, to help focus uh, future assessments and adaptation planning priorities based on shoreline conditions. And so. With that, let's go to the next slide. Um, the type of impacts associated with sea level rise that we considered in a humble bay and would be similar elsewhere is uh, shoreline erosion as a result of wave energy uh, and rising water elevations, tidal inundation, of course, but also backwater flooding as we get stormwater runoff coming from the upland watersheds uh, reaching the tidewater areas, and then rising or emerging groundwater in response to sea level rise, and lastly, saltwater intrusion. If we go to the next slide. Shoreline erosion uh, is a critical feature on Humboldt Bay. Uh, we have 102 miles of shoreline. 75% of the shoreline is consisting of artificial structures that are holding back tide waters from inundating a low lying area. So uh, shoreline erosion is a major concern on Humboldt Bay. And if the next slide, our shoreline, uh, next slide, please. Our shoreline fortifications are being impacted by uh, extreme uh, water elevations and uh, uh, wind waves and storm events. And so fortifications need to be maintained on shorelines. And with the next slide, we look at areas uh, where we have shoreline um, fortifications, but with our extreme tides in, that we're experiencing now, these are being overtopped and bluff erosion, the areas that are being protected by uh, seawalls are gonna need to be upgraded and maintained in order to counter rising water elevations. And looking at the next slide. Shoreline erosion ultimately will lead to tidal inundation. And on Humboldt Bay, there's some 8,000 acres of low-lying former salt marsh that was diked off that would be uh, tidally inundated the moment we have a breach uh, by mean high or high water or just the daily high tide. So shoreline of, uh, breaching is a major concern and the extent of tidal inundation would be substantial just from uh, single breaches. Looking at the next slide, Tidal inundation is also affecting some uh, disadvantaged communities that are in low lying areas just during our uh, King Tide events that we're having. And on the next slide, you'll see that uh, our King Tides are also affecting local transportation areas um, that uh, traverse uh, low lying areas. And then Backwater uh, flooding is becoming much more frequent uh, when we have stormwater runoff that coincides during king tide events. Uh, low lying areas are becoming detention basins, you know, for floodwaters because they can't drain during the high tide events. Uh, sea level rise will certainly exasperate that. But if we go to the next slide, probably the most uh, incipient impact of sea level rise is really emerging groundwater. Uh, the 8,000 plus acres of uh, former salt marsh on Humboldt Bay is actually lower in elevation than salt marsh uh, was just due to compaction of the soil. Um, with the tide water being cut off, we don't have sediment accretion in the soils. Uh, loss of organic materials caused the elevations to actually decline. 
therefore they're closer to uh, groundwater elevation. And with just a meter of uh, sea level rise, much of that 8,000 acres would become emergent uh, bodies of water, open water, and the resulting land use conversion and impacts to assets in those areas could be significant. It is very difficult to build resiliency to emergency groundwater on that much acreage. Looking at the next slide. Uh, the mapping of the former salt marsh uh, that has been diked off and eliminated, these are the, the low lying areas that will be most at risk from emerging uh, groundwater of anywhere from two to three feet. And so um, it's critical for us that uh, we know what assets are located in these regions. So if we look at the next slide, uh, what we did next in our vulnerability assessments was really an asset inventory. And uh, looking at assets is very similar to what you do for hazard mitigation planning when you're looking at flood hazards, looking at infrastructure, whether utilities, wastewater treatment and collection systems, transportation infrastructure like Highway 101 or local roads, but also looking at land uses. So we have disadvantaged communities, coastal dependent industrial areas, and then coastal resources, uh, agricultural lands are also environmentally significant habitat areas. And um, um, most importantly to the WIAT, there's a significant number of cultural sites at risk uh, around Humboldt Bay um, that were inventoried. And while not an asset, these are certainly issues or items of concern that you want to uh, map and identify uh, uh, when they, these areas might be affected by rising water elevations. And those are contaminated sites. Uh, and on Humboldt Bay, we have a nuclear fuel storage site that's at risk from sea level rise. So we've conducted several asset inventories uh, to identify what's at risk and develop a timetable for their exposure. If we could go to the next slide. Hey, Alderon, can I ask you to wrap it up in, in about a minute? We, I just wanna make sure we have enough time for our final speaker. Okay, let's go. The next slide, please. And so the, we have a major wastewater treatment facility that's at risk of the city of Arcata. And our next slide, please. We have a nuclear fuel uh, storage site that's only 115 feet away from a bluff that earlier I showed you the uh, high water uh, overtopping the fortification. It's in the highest wave environment on the entire uh, location of Humboldt Bay. That's experienced 1500 feet of shoreline retreat in just 60 years before it was fortified. Uh, the next slide. And so we broke up uh, Humboldt Bay into hydrologic uh, subunits and next slide, please. Uh, and we have, you know, go back, please. Um, we've uh, cataloged our, and in the inventory of assets by hydrographic subunits. So we can help to use that information to prioritize subunits for further treatment. And if we can go to the next slide, please. And in our most recent hazard mitigation planning effort of 2019, we included a sea level rise component, looking at one meter of sea level rise and two meters of sea level rise. And with the assessor uh, office database, uh, we're able to quantify the number of uh, buildings, uh, structures, uh, and population and value of developments that could be affected just by those two thresholds of sea level rise on Humboldt Bay which you can see is significant going from one meter to two meters. And lastly, the next slide. There's been almost a dozen vulnerability assessment studies and work done on Humboldt Bay. So the county compiled all of the vulnerability assessment work and presented it based on hydrographic areas uh, so that it would facilitate doing future and focus vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning uh, within an associated GIS database. And the last slide is all I have. Next slide. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alderon. Lots of great information. Um, we do have one final speaker, Chasneet Sharma. So let me just stop sharing my screen and pass it over to her. Um, Jasneet Sharma is joining us from the County of San Mateo to talk about some of their adaptation work and the data and tools um, experience that she has uh, working on vulnerability assessments. And just one Hi. quick note before, sorry, sorry, Jasneet. That's okay, um, go ahead. 
we, we aren't going to have any time for, for Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions, please type them into the chat and we'll see if we can follow up afterwards. Um, and thanks, everyone. OK, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. And just a quick clarification. Uh, I was in San Mateo County, and now I am in Santa Clara County for the last uh, little over a year or so. And can you um, see my screen, Nikki? Yes. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. Again, I'm just Neet Sharma. I'm the director for the Office of Sustainability in Santa Clara County. And um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to kind of what I share out today. It's not going to be as technical in nature. I think the two earlier presentations did a great job. I'm coming more from the approach of um, wanting to share just my overall experience on climate adaptation and vulnerability assessments and kind of drawing on my experience working both in San Mateo and now in Santa Clara County on uh, climate adaptation. So just a quick uh, overview, uh, our office kind of has a big sustainability vision and uh, this slide here shares out on the sustainability vision that we have for the county, which is achieved through four priority areas and eight goals and 30 strategies. Uh, so the one that really I'm speaking to is the one around climate protection and defense, uh, which is the first priority area. And the way we uh, achieve this vision is um, we really try to integrate sustainability as a core function within our county operations. Uh, we coordinate and support cross-departmental sustainability efforts and really build networks and empower collective action and transformation as well. So a couple of things I would like to share is, you know, even before you start down the road of a vulnerability assessment, kind of choosing the approach and also thinking about some basic questions is something I found to be really critical early on. Um, so the, you really want to be pretty clear on your purpose and the outcome. Sometimes it can be as simple as you want to understand the exposure risks and the scale of risk and impacts, uh, or it could be broader than that, right? You could be trying to also support other local assessment uh, efforts like we do in the county. Not only do we want to look at impacts on our unincorporated areas, but we also want to support local vulnerability assessments that our cities take on um, in the county as well. Um, will this lead to a development of a countywide or even a multi-jurisdictional resilience strategy and actional outcomes? So you want to be kind of having that lens early on as well. And then to what extent would you use this to raise awareness among community groups? And then which community groups are you thinking or community members will you be reaching out to as well? Um, you've got to kind of think through, you know, project partner roles, stakeholders, these other uh, bullet points I'll kind of speak to in my next slides. So as you think of kind of stakeholder and project partners, I think that's really the key point is you want to try and identify early on kind of what structure are you going to use? One typically sees this technical committee, a policy committee. Sometimes you'll have more of a community-based committee as well. So I think having some early conversations on really who your stakeholders are and what role they're going to play. An important one to call out would be this approach where you're really trying to build the capacity of the community or key community groups as you're taking this work on. And one way which you can do, I've shared this example from the County of San Mateo that just came out recently. They're starting their hazard mitigation plan. And it was a request for quotes that they put out for CBOs to actually come in and lead the efforts on behalf of the county on outreach and education as well. So it's, a, it's more of a partner role that you have with your CBOs versus them just engaging in a technical or a policy committee as well. We're really aiming to build their capacity and I'll share an example of this in a subsequent slide as well. So I could say a lot about this slide, right? And I think uh, both with what uh, was shared in the, uh, the tool early on through CalAdapt and through our two presenters as well, there is a lot of data out there and you're gonna have to kind of deal with this pretty early on. Sometimes it starts as early as when you put out an RFP and you get the proposals from the consultants. I still remember in an earlier project where we got about six, seven proposals and every proposal had a different data set they were using, had a different methodology they were using, a different proprietary tool that the consultant was proposing. So from the very get-go, 
it's a lot of decision making that you're going to have to make on because based on what models and what data you choose, you're going to go a different route um, as well. So to the extent possible, I would say this is where you start leaning on some of your regional and your state partners. Early on when I was doing this work, there wasn't a lot of kind of this data at the state level, which is, is now. So really try and build that consistency. If you're looking at sea level rise, BCDC and the Adapting to Rising Tides project has a lot, done a lot of work on flooding and sea level rise. Can you tap into those and build consistency across the models that you're using? Um, and then seeking technical support. I think even as we were reviewing our proposals, we realized we didn't know all these models that were being proposed. So bringing in some of our academic partners, bringing in some of our regional and state experts into the process to tell us, like, tell us more about this, what a consultant is proposing. Um, I'll be honest with you, some things we learned along the way as we were doing the process. Um, so just wanted to share that. And then also, you know, keeping, future updates in mind. So uh, the county in Santa Clara, we did a vulnerability assessment in 2015, and we're now in the stage where actually updating the vulnerability assessment. In 2015, you know, we used uh, OCOF data for sea level rise, but now we're building more off on the BCDC layers that they've created from adapting to rising tides. But there's another layer to that is, um, in the last three years since those layers came out, We've had local projects that have taken place in Santa Clara County for shoreline protection. So we had to connect with those projects. We had to get the information. We have to uh, adjust our digital elevation models to account for that. So you, so even now we're thinking something that was done five years ago, what data is available now and what approach are we gonna take moving forward for our updates as well. And this is just an example of kind of two vulnerability assessments that I've been engaged with, and they're both kind of, you know, went in different routes. The first one is the uh, climate ready SMC vulnerability assessment that we did for heat, wildfire and, and precipitation in San Mateo County. And um, the tool or the model that came out was more of an exposure map that people could go and interact with and also try and find out um, how the transportation network and communities are going to be impacted. Meanwhile, the one on the right side is uh, from, San, from Santa Clara County, where it was set up more as a decision-making tool for cities and public agencies who want to do their own assessment using this model. And when they go in there, after they've chosen the climate impact, they can choose whether they want to, which type of asset they want to look at, buildings, communication, waste and water facilities, hazardous sites. We have about, we have about nine types of different assets in there. And then there's also this economic analysis that comes out of this tool, which looks at the cost of replacing um, an asset, loss of fiscal revenue, um, any change in operational costs as well. So two very different approaches and very different kind of outcomes that come out of the products. Um, and then I wanted to also just elaborate on building the community's capacity as you're doing this process. So we, we typically like to use uh, data to validate lived experience. And I would say, take the flip approach if possible, really use some the lived experience of the community to actually validate what you're finding out through the data and if possible, um, support their capacity building. So this was an example through the Climate Ready Project in San Mateo where uh, we gave funding to a community group in East Palo Alto to do some training with a core team. They then went out and engaged the community members to further uh, understand the vulnerabilities in East Palo Alto, but it was all building off their lived experience. We did not start with the data. We started with their lived experience and it actually ended with uh, on the ground pilot project, which was the installation of a water security feature. So if you can line up a vulnerability assessment with a project on the ground, it's something the community really values. And my last slide mainly speaks more to the messaging. I think this is one where uh, we sometimes fall short. We have so much technical data in our vulnerability assessments that we really don't think on how we're going to communicate the risks to our community and our community groups as well. Um, so no surprise, uh, scientific explanations can only go so far in engaging people. And this fear and anxiety actually uh, freezes people and it, it does not prompt them to take actions. Really, uh, 
try and find approaches whereby which you can use simple infographics to share the risks with people. Um, and very early on, if possible, uh, pivot to solutions. So this was a map that we had developed again in San Mateo where we wanted to show the risks, but we used a different approach to visualize the risk, but also showed people the solutions, not what was at risk, but really showed what was the solution in the areas that were at risk as well. Um, so I ran through my slides in my presentation, but again, this is how you can contact me uh, if you need further information as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Oh, everyone has so much great information to present. Um, and I'm so sad that we weren't able to get into the Q&A, but hopefully folks were able to get out their questions in the chat. Um, and I just want to emphasize those last couple of slides that Jasmine uh, presented about the importance of really ground truthing the data and the science with lived experiences um, and the, the insights and experience and, and community science that community partners and, and the public um, can provide to vulnerability assessment processes. Um, so without further ado, we're going to just go ahead and wrap it up. But um, our, uh, I'm putting my contact information up on the slide. I'll leave that up as people trickle out here. And we will be sharing this recording and the slides and the transcript um, all with everyone who registered. Um, so thanks again so much to our wonderful speakers. Um, lots of great information. And we'll see you all at our next webinar.